actually uh, what we will learn is that although I speak now much about kinship and of course about the state, uh, when I did my actual studies, kinship was not the major thing. It was always there, but um, it uh, was not the main topic, so to say. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I hope I get through my paper that it is not too long, but I think I have an hour or so, so we'll go. Um, I start with some introductory uh, words. Current anthropological perspectives on statehood, politics, and kinship contern, contain emergent argumentative orthodoxies. One is the argument that the relationship between kinship and statehood uh, as an anthropological topic contains a binary positioning indicating a shifting boundary between us and them, which has to be overcome. The other is a critic of the continuities of an evolutionist thought style, a residual of the 19th century, according to which Kinship is linked to the natural or primitive states of political affairs, while territorial organization and eventually the formation of the state belongs to a higher order. The new orthodoxy, orthodoxy would rather claim that kinship and state develop in a mutual entanglement. The anthropological critique of the continui continuities of binary and evolutionist uh, position positions in the study of kinship, politics, and statehood demands for the work on historical shifting boundaries between binary constructions as family kinship, private public, individual communal, civil society state, stateless or segmentary society and state, primitive and civilized, and the formation of the state. It likewise demands for the development of ethnographic techniques to grasp the complexities, lines of decision-making and command, strings of communication, of actors, ideas, ideologies, imaginaries, affectivities and materialities linked to state making. My contribution will discuss the development of the intersection between kinship politics and state formation in anthropology, which found a prominent landmark with African political systems edited by Maya Fords and Evans Pritchard in 1940. As a traveling text, African political systems and similar models on the Nua from Evans Pritchard and the Talensi from Maya Fords contributed to the global rise of British social anthropology, its paradigms, models, and its academic language. And the language argued now in terms of lineage or corporate groups, when they talked about kinship groups instead of SIP, Zippe in German, or Gains, what was used in France and Germany. Completely avoiding male bonding or age gen generation grading as an asset of statehood, what was at that time very much discussed in Germany and also in the United States. Outside the shadow of African political systems, US American, German, Italian, and French anthropologists developed different presentations of the formation of the state, like the so-called conquest theory of state or the centrality of male bonding practices. In a curious way, some divergent theoretical and practical approaches converged in the 1930s and 1940s in anthropological and orientalist Ethiopianist encounters with the independent Ethiopian empire, which shed some contrastive light on the representational practices of kinship politics and the formation of the state. The contrast also highlights the specific colonial situation 
which is materialized in African political systems. This colonial situation, termed as indirect rule, from which many of the early studies on kinship politics in the state derived, invited for styles of critic. The critics was then transactional anthropology, Marxist, post-structural, post-colonial, of course, and contributed to modes of extending assumed kinship-based practices like the transmission of oral history into literary practices, as, for instance, Zach Goody did. The poster picture you see here derives from a context where a liberation front that did for organizational purposes not rely much on formal kinship during the 1980s introduced a literacy campaign which contained many ambiguities about the ultimate target of liberation from or within Ethiopia, and last but not least, about the bounds of kinship and the state. What, at that time, when I did my studies, what was not so obvious. The second part, literacy, texts, and imaginations. During the 1980s, I did a study on an emergent collective political actor in the Horn of Africa, the Oromo Liberation Front, which claimed to represent a downtrodden population majority of the Ethiopian Empire. Ethiopia was then a socialist military dictatorship. Oromo were used to be known at that time as Gala, which had a derogatory meaning. Part of the struggle was about a sustainable change from Gala to the self-identification as Oromo and also its international acceptance. My research took place in different refugees' contexts, in Germany, in Kenya, in Sudan, in Somalia, in Djibouti, in Egypt. The research was possible by a high degree of what is now called complicity with political actors and circumstantiality. That means fast adaption of research methods to changing contexts. Both terms, complicity and circumstantiality, did not yet belong to the anthropological toolbox as it is now. Likewise, transnational or multi-sided fieldwork was not yet an established fact of fieldwork. So to find my own style of doing fieldwork, I had to muddle through. One way of muddling through was to find ethnographic artifacts related to the political movement, which were present everywhere. That means in every of the country where I did my fieldwork. These artifacts were texts used for literacy programs among refugees, written in the Oromo language and in <coughs> Latin characters called Kube. What you see on the poster is a group of young men assembled at the table under the flag of the Oromo Liberation Front. The picture is from 1984 and it was made uh, in the Sudan. The young men were members of the Oromo Liberation Front and they were reading and discussing a text in the Oromo language written in Kube. Full membership in the OLF was linked to the requirement of being literate in the Oromo language. At one stage of research, I found a similarity with the development of Protestantism in some Oro Oromo areas of Western Ethiopia during the 1930s and 1940s. Full church membership required the ability to read the Bible in the Oromo language. The script used then was the Ethiopian script, hence scripture, reading and separate community building had a, pre, a regional prehistory, prehistory outside the immediate 
political context. Now again, years later, I could relate that also to the issue we discussed yesterday, the impact of ancestors on actual politics. I will not do it now, but I will do it later when we come to the discussion. During the early 1980s, a number of anthropological ideas about literacy and the emergence of a standardized national language circulated. One was, of course, a classic. For Friedrich Engels, scripture was a sign that political economy, class, and state had reached human development. The rule of blood ties, kinship, was over. Eric Wolf had an outright liberationist perspective and saw literacy as a means to develop action in concert and as a motor for new social visions. The liberationist perspective was also promoted by the Oromo Liberation Front, recruiting on the ideas about conscientization promoted by the Latin American Catholic priest Paolo Freire. Anthropologist Zach Goody had a more conservative position. Scripture was a means to change the mindset of traditional people. People who used to memorize events and legal settings, like land rights, by the oral means of information transfer in terms of kinship and genealogical relation. They now used more abstract means of information transfer, which privileged state and search. That means scripture, state, and search go together. That recalled uh, position advanced years before by the German anthropologist Richard Turnwald, for whom classical kinship societies express their legal thinking through kinship relations, while scripture stood for a specialized world of legal expert who developed a language incomprehensible for ordinary folks. Lawrence Quader, a Marxist anthropologist at that time, who was also my teacher, had a dialectical approach. Scripture was on one side a means of statehood, interfering from above into village life by archiving it. On the other side, it was, all, it was also in combination with monotheistic religion, a means to participate in a wider universe of knowledge. Ernest Gellner regarded scripture and standardized language as a functional necess necessity of industrial society. One Ethiopian author who wrote about the literacy program among peasants during the early stage of the Ethiopian revolution in 1974 argued that it was to produce party cadres. This was obviously also the case among the Oromo Liberation Front. Fashionably, fashionable was also Benedict Anderson's perspective of seeing emergent nationalisms as communities of readers who shared text about imagined and invented communities. The blueprints for imagined communities were taken from local experiences like kinship, groups, village neighbors, and closely related territorial units. The readings of the solemn young men on my poster picture were in case the case in point. They read texts like that. And I will give you now an example of uh, such a uh, text. I have here uh, an English translation of a picture story. You might have a look into it. The story is called Tura and the Cattle. The uh, text was first published in 1980. As an illustrative example for the invention of community within the Oromo Liberation Front, I give you a little text published in 1980. The plot goes like that. A young man of a village, Tura, 
wants to dance with a beautiful girl, Salto. However, Salto is very specific and does not want to dance. Eventually, thieves come to the village and steal the cattle. Salto becomes angry and want to beat the dog that was sleeping while the thieves came. The dog refuses to be beaten. The elders intervene and ask Tura to find the thieves. Tura would only follow the thieves if Salto would dance with him. Salto now agrees to dance with him. If she is allowed to beat the dog, the dog agrees to be beaten <laughs> if it would receive milk. Now a chain of demands and refusals develops. At the end of the chain, the farmer demands a knife. The elders go to the smith, and the smith is a good man. He gives the knife for free. In the end, Salto is allowed to beat the dog. Tura dances with Salto, and Tura finally follows the thief and brings the cattle back. So this uh, story has, uh, includes two items. One is the, so to say, the moral side I'm now talking about. There is also a grammatical side in it. Uh, <laughs> I was struggling at that time with the grammatical side in the first place. It's uh, about forms of the verb, about transitive and intransitive forms, to beat, to be beaten, to make others to be beaten, and so on. What I then found later, or what I interpreted into the text, was a vision of a new moral collective. The comic-like story about the complicated relation between Tura, what means the late born, and Salto, what means the most beautiful, the excellent, is formally characterized by an archaizant form. But it contains a so-called hidden innovation, which propose a new moral collective. The collective of the community is defined as the people, umata, which in Oromo parlance is similar to folk. A typical innovation going with nationalism is the idea of generalized reciprocity, as some anthropologists, like the late Georg Elvert, would have argued. The Shane story describes social life as a circle of dependencies, expectations, and duties which link humans, animals, nature, and God. All actors start in the first place to act according to self-interested, individualized principles of exchange that goes deep into the initial affective relationship between Tura and Salto. The self-interested behavior prevents collective action persecuting the thief. In the final instance, the smith, the Tumtu, appears as a moral person who does not act self-interested. This opens the way for a new chain of reciprocal moral acts, which enables the people for collective action against the thieves. The positive character of the Tumtu is a complete innovation which disregards traditional positions of avoidance against artisans and tumtus. When I discovered this story nearly 40 years back, it was an abstract text used for liter literacy and first readers. It had no immediate bearing on social practice. One could think about its function in a refugee context where patterns of the past did not matter. The message was people should support each other regardless where from they came. I compared that with a related folk tale among the Burana Oromo of the Ethiopian uh, Kenyan borderlands. The traditional version, version goes deep into intrafamilial and gendered conflicts between an adop adopted slave boy and his freeborn sister. Here, in the end, not the generous Tumtu, but a deciding adoptive father who solves the problem by siding with the boy. However, when I did research in Ethiopia in 1997, 
the story got another turn. I overheard the talk of two acquaintances about a known banker among the Oromo. He was already an elderly man. He used to have a high rank in the Ministry of Finance in the last government of <coughs> Emperor Haile Selassie. He survived the days of the socialist military regime as an official of the World Bank. With the new government, he returned to Ethiopia and became engaged in private banking. At that stage, he was just about to join a small opposition party to become a politician. Now my acquaintances talked about him and one said laconic, well, he is a tuntu. What that meant was that he had no high status among local Oromo society. Later, my acquaintance explained that the banker had used the opportunity to acquire education and state employment. That was a way to advance. Nevertheless, that did not change his status of being a Tumtu and not being from a respective, respected lineage among the Oromo. Given that fact that at that time the ruling state party in the Oromo area of Ethiopia tried desperately to find cutters among respected lineages, that means among extended kin groups, it hints on changing tensions about status, political association, and local routing of the state. Now, the plot of Tura and the Cattle derived from a pastoralist background with an obvious background in a local settle of pastoralist Oromo of the southern borderlands between Ethiopia and Kenya. The text has a clear moral message. It contains the noble face of a people, generalized, extended reciprocity as an ideal. A second topic of literacy text for first readers found my interest, which gave a slightly different message. A number of first readers' textbooks introduced Helissa, the hare, a trickster-like character and a relative to African-American brother rabbit. Helissa tries, fails, and tries again. He tries to trick out the bigger animals. He makes traps and falls into his own traps. Helisa is embodied sustainability, but also full of ambiguity and circumstantial behavior, which meant an ability to switch between situations, to exploit situations, and an adaptive flexibility to fastly changing context. During the early 1980s, I took that as a symbol for many young Oromo men who came as refugees into the different orbits of migration in the Horn of Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and then also North America. They had to muddle through, never giving up regardless of the conditions. Forty years later, anthropologists found the ways of trickster-like forms of muddling through in many civil war-prone situations in Africa. The trickster, his, her, ambiguities and flexible capacities became part of the analytic canon to approach post-colonial predicaments in Africa. The trickster became the worldwide patron of the so-called sans papiers, migrants without valid paper, but also a symbol for idiosyncratic and monstrous dictators. In the academic and analytical discourse, the trickster continued to be ambiguous. Now, what about demanding the state at this, um, at this stage in 1984? Uh, the text mentions above were designed for first readers. They were, of course, also political text for advanced readers and full members of the OLF. And some of the advanced text concerned history and political programmatics. In 1991, the OLF returned to Ethiopia and took for a year part in a transitory government until they were driven back into <coughs> exile 
as a result of a power struggle with the Tigre People, uh, People's Liberation Front. With the OLF back in Ethiopia at that time and transitionally in power, a problem became crucial that had been rather abstract during my field work. What was the OLF struggling for, apart from against the Ethiopian government under Mengistu Haile Mariam and apart from struggling for the recognition of being Oromo? Was the organization struggling for an independent nation star state or for an equal status of Oromo within Ethiopia? In a summary paper of my thesis from 1990, I had touched the issue beforehand. That means one year before um, the OLF returned to Ethiopia. There's a widely circulating little text, a brief introduction into Oromia, written under the pen name Gada Melba, which not incidentally recalls the glorious days of 16th century Oromo victories against the Ethiopian Empire. The version in the Oromo language is an expanded version translation from the original English text. Although the text does not in a proper, sen proper sense express OLF's views on history, it is everywhere in the sphere of influence existing, existing where the OLF works. The English version says it is belief, believed that the rebirth of an independent Oromo nation state in the Horn of Africa will not remain a dream or a wish. The word used for the state in the Oromo version is a lone cum neologism, taliga, which apparently derives from a Somali verb to order, talis. But in a number of other exile texts, taliga either appears as politics, then synonymous for the Arabic lone siyasa, or as administration. However, young opinion leaders among the RC Oromo from Bale in Somali camps translated Taliga with movement and development. Instead of having the demand for an independent Oromo nation state, the text was read as movement of Oromo society towards independence. One can be sure that Oromo opinion leaders in the Somali camps had not read Hegel and that they were not particularly interested in the relationship between the state and civil society. However, their relativizing reading of Taliga was important. A movement is not a state or something with the capacity to order others. While the OLF went into exile again, the text in an Oromo and Amharic version survived in many Ethiopian bookstores, where I found them in 1997. Only in the English version of the text, the demand for statehood was unambiguous. Now let's go a little bit into theory. The interfaces between kinship politics and state as it developed from my perspective. For the purpose of my contribution, I screened a dozen of summary articles on the anthropology of the state and political anthropology, published in handbooks and journals for uh, its mentioning of state and kinship. And with recent, I mean things that appeared in the last two, three years. If they mention the topic at all, they all would agree on the linkage between African political system and um, the development of the discussion. But they would also mention that the kinship state discussion became a vanishing topic. The real anthropology of the state seems to have started with the ethnographies of, ethnographies of the 1990s, which introduced horizontal perspectives on real life people, the actors in interface zone with state institutions. That, that, this is to some degrees an error. The demand to look at the nation state as a continuing pro project involving collective experience and experiments 
came in 1974, far already from the established core of social anthropology. Lawrence Crader, in his Anthropology of the State, published in 1968, suggested to look at how social order relates itself to a center. The analysis, analysis is framed as a folk state binary. And uh, the examples he took, uh, the chapter in his book is on the Slavonic state, uh, uh, yes, that means he looks particularly at what happened in Poland and in Belarus and at the border areas uh, towards Lithuania and so, because <coughs> his own background is, uh, is from Belarus. The analysis is framed, as, uh, as I said, um, folk state uh, binary, Crader's folk was including us. And at the same time, full of kinship. Changing the state is the title of our today's roundtable. Universality of state planning and changing the people was a topic of an anthropological study called People and the State by R.F. Robertson in 1984. So the shift of direction whom to change change might be an improvement, might be not, uh, we will see this afternoon. Most contributions about the summary expressed, uh, among the summaries is expressed a constructive, deconstructive perspective on statehood, which rooted the state in human, cultural, and affective, imaginary, not intangible institution linked to economic and material conditions. Few contributions were related to Marxist analysis of statehood. Few went deeply into the full legacy of anthropological state, uh, thought on statehood, statehood society, and the emergence of the formation of the state. Some regard kinship structure, structures as a possible mode of parastatal governance either in support of more state or in crit critic, seeing a permanent contradiction between the obsessive and intrusive powers of the nation state and local experiences of governance by the means of extended kinship. In some cases, kinship appears as an artifact in a colorful puzzle of hidden objects, what, what is called in Germany a Wimmelbild, where it receives beauties in the eyes of the ethnographic observer, or it does not receive. Some, like Thomas Bierschenk and Jean-Pierre Olivier de Sardin, refuse to deliver colorful puzzles, but insist on concrete observed empirical data. They look on state institutions which are real for them as arenas, with different actors and interests on all sides of the office desk. Kinship is not necessarily within the arena, but dealt with when it enters. That would also be my approach. However, I understand that such a type of ethnographic research is sometimes difficult to achieve and it is sometimes easier to construct a Wimmelbild. Studying the state means mostly studying upward. It includes power differentials between the observed and the observer, which in this case give, gives power to the object of observation. Such ethnographies are likely to use also remote and hidden methods, with ethnographers entangled by complicity and circumstantial decision about how to do the research. Not only the state or state clients might be cunning, when dealing with the state also the researcher has to learn being cunning. Of course, for our kinship and politics team, which is represented by Tatjana, by Andre, and partly by me, the issue is clear. Kinship matters for the state and for politics. We have to beat the drum. Now, kinship certainly appears in many pragmatic fields, in law, the new family forms, 
pets were LGBT and so on, so social services like care, that Jana to talked yesterday about, it, property and inheritance, new ways of dealing with descent and genealogy, inclusive adoption, reproductive technology, technology, but also what is called child harvesting of the rich among the poor, huh? travels to do the adoption and so on, and then who is adopt, adopted and how. And then there is a wide field of governance and security with contradictory assumptions about good and bad practices of aspects of kinship. One side, the development field sees sustainable social relations and mutual reliance in times of distress. On the other side, security actors see criminality, mafia-like behavior, clandestine net networks for the mobilization of violence. That means kinship also matters in the field of security and political economy. There are many fields where kinship appears in disguise as indirect extensions or as metaphors, which give as if illusions. Nepotism, as a way of giving privileges to family member, has a direct, direct terminolo uh, terminological relation to kinship. Corruption appears as a distance and metaphorical association when it is compared with incest. It is something which one should not commit within the family or in intimate relation. The British anthropologist Annette Edwards looked at an innocent technical term like transparency. With regard to genetical analysis, transparency is associated with the right to know where one comes from. On the other side, it appears as a generalized metaphor for nothing to hide or seeing through, be it individuals, families, groups of kin, or wider social units. It appears as a new type of extension under neoliberal condition, which links up with kinship and its associated intimacies and helps to create naturalized analogies, analogies about the transparent family of the West, us, uh, belong to an open society against closed and invisible, intransparent kinship groups associated with the South or with the Middle East or whatsoever. Here we are in a new world of binaries. A last topic coming up from the mentioned summaries is the general approach to binaries associated with kinship. <coughs> The issue is raised in a valuable article by Alejandro Agudo Sanchez, who asked for the historical development of powerful binaries like kinship and the state. This is a topic taken from um, Tatiana and uh, Erdmute Alba. However, Sanchez hints to the fact that binaries are not just ours, which then travel elsewhere, but that binaries also develop elsewhere under other scholar and temporal axes and influence the wider discourse. In fact, Sanchez recalls indirectly the position of 19th century social Darwinist sociology William Graham Sumner, the inventor of the flexible V group, for whom kinship was only one of possible articulation of boundary setting binaries. Boundary work, as Tatiana <coughs> described, it, and the quest where and how the boundary works is crucial, a crucial task of anthropology. Until the late 1960s, political anthropology was dominated by the lineage paradigm with the assumption that in stateless society extended and corporate groups of kinspeople formed the backbone of political and social order. Some anthropological trends, like those supported by uh, Georges Balandier and his political anthropology, which was published in 1968, refined the topic and looked systematically 
on internal power structures related to age and gender within the kinship groups. Balanier himself was influenced by Max Gluckman, the Manchester School of Anthropology, and their perspective on conflict within kin groups. He himself should influence a younger generation of French anthropologists who would link up the quest for internal power structure in lineage societies with Marx's questions about reproduction, labor processes, value production, exploitation, commodities, hence the whole realm of political economy. Earlier, Balandier had coined the term colonial situation, meaning a totality of deformational impacts on the social, cultural, and psychological life of subjected population. It was a machine for binaries, this colonial situation. And African political system is part of those binaries, from my perspective. The term colonial situation was later uptaken by Franz Fanon and entered through him the universe of post-colonial theory. The approach to situation was originally adapted from Max Gluckman, for whom it meant the holistic ethnography of diverse impact and actors in a given place and moment what others then summarized under the name of arena. Gluckman's ethnography was in a Malinovskian mode extensive, not model-making reductive, as in the case of Evans Pritchard, Redcliffe Brown, and many of the studies assembled in African political system. The classical text by Gluckman is known as The Bridge, describing the ritual of the opening of a bridge in Zululand, South Africa, published in 1940, in which different sections of the Zulu, traditionalists, migrant workers, Christians, non-Christians, and representatives of the colonial order, like settlers, administrators, missionaries, took part. Luckman's text was the first systematic attempt to bring representatives of the colonial state and subjected people into one ethnographic picture. The colonial in such a situation defined for Balandier the power asymmetries and unequal, unequal chances for social inclusion on, and exclusion of the actors. George Balandier is tremendous important for the development of early political anthropology and for the development of transformative perspectives on kinship and the state, but it's now outside the scope of this contru contribution to go deeper into it. Throughout the 1960s, 1970s, the lineage paradigm as an indicator for stability and a universal mode of social organization lost much of its aura. Apart from Marxist anthropology, transactionalism and network theory developed in a distance or even outright selling challenge of lineage theory. Example from South Asian anthropology, as provided by Frederick Barth or Frederick Bailey, indicated the ubiquity of internal conflicts within larger kinship groups. The challenge, the parallel perspective of extended kinship as a repository for intimacy and amity and reciprocity forwarded at the same time by Meyer Fords. The French Marxist interest in the lineage mode of production brought some revival and linked it up with political economy and the emerging issues of gender and power. In combination with the American onslaught on kinship studies in general by David Schneider, the once prominent anthropology of kinship at large developed into one academic field among others in a wider context of academic pluralism as far as the development within anthropology in the West concerned. Some aspects of extended kinship studies survived under different headings. The lineage mode of production re-emerged in the quest for household economies and the political economy in development countries. 
its situation in the world economy and under conditions of planned development. Extended kinship became regarded as part, of par uh, as part and parcel of solidarity under the conditions of chronic crisis, then particularly linked to experience of structural adjustment, but not pr primarily as an issue sui generis. Another area of survival was the interface between legal anthropology and conflict anthropology in the footsteps of Max Gluckman as a social anthropologist. By the early 1990s, political and legal anthropology reformulated interests in local and pluralist modes of conflict resolution, including practices, practices in extended kinship groups. In the year 1996, the Sudanist anthropologist com diplomat Francis Mede Denk published a treatise on sovereignty, responsibility, and conflict management in Africa, which gave traditional conflict management involving lineages and clans a central value, not just for local affairs, but also to argue that the state has to manage this kind of conflict management to advance its claim on sovereignty in the international system. The topic provided traveling blueprints for the imagination of parastatal governance. During the next two decades, it should inform inter intervention-minded academics and practitioners about possible improvements for failed states or conditions of limited statehood. What developed within the last 30 years can be regarded as a travel of text on segmentary political structures and extended kinship structures into the paper world of international relations, transnational organizations, and international NGOs, the toolboxes of implied development, the military and civil military logics of dual use. The governance approach towards extended kinship systems became part and parcel of the imaginations about low-cost administration and justice as a substitute for and outside the sphere of the state and was presented as a civil means to intervene peacefully in mediating into the rising armed conflicts in Asia and Africa. By the late 1990s, the churches, UN bodies for development, and the global development industry like Swiss Aid, GTZ, USAID, DFID, and others had adapted the topic. With the last two decades of wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia, it became a means of warfare and also lawfare of insurgency and counterinsurgency, in particular in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. Increasingly, extended kinship, the tribe, the clan, became securitized and appeared as a threat pattern emerging from the global south. This entanglement of economic, legal, and security interests in extended kinship structures contributed also to a continuous, continuous othering of the topic. The early years of the new millennium brought the idea into anthropology to look on the effective, effective side of statehood, the impact on collective and individual feeling, joys, and fears. Earlier, some of the contents of the new research to topic was captured under the heading of propaganda. Also, ideas about the relation between ritual and politics, influenced by the writings of Victor Turner, went into this direction. The emergent series on counterinsurgency went full swing into the politics of influencing the effects of kinship groups, either by the carrot, that means influencing hearts and minds, what is one of the slogans with counterinsurgency, with the benefits of civil military development handouts, or by the stick, by the installation of collective shock and awe, military village raids, bombings from above, and the silent killings from the drones. 
I'm very aware that securitization, weaponization, and othering of kinship is not just a pattern which occurs in the global south. The long durée of the Somali civil war shows related analytical patterns for the mobilization and manipulations of affectivities among Somali actors. Practices, practices of wars mutually influence each other. Seen from the perspective of politics, states, and affection, stick and carrot turn amity and intimacy into weaponry. During the last decade, the fears about clandestine units of kinship-like organi organized enemy warriors received a niche in the imagination of hybrid warfare, forming one end of an arc of sorg with computerized high-tech threats at the opposite side. Kinship became weaponized and securitized. The securitized aspect is added by the growing technology and applied practices of genetic screening for individuals and among population. The military side of this development runs under the outspoken heading of extensive kinship analysis and imagines the possibility of genomic analyses to capture the quotation, subtribal affiliation, subethnic characterization and clan level evaluation of a suspect's possible linkages. Quotation end. Now that was a part uh, on looking at status kinship where kinship comes immediately in. There were other anthropological as perspectives on the state um, at the same time. It would be an error to believe that the ethnographicum systematic study of kinship politics in the state started with African political system. This text became a landmark, but there were other approaches before and beside. Friedrich Engels' reading of Morgan's ancient society um, led to a, a mechanistic and linear adaption of Morgan's schemata of the primitive linked to kinship, the barbarian, early state, and the state. Uh, Marx's own dialectical positions on statehood saw statehood as an escrescence, as he said, of civil society, which implies from the start a possible side-by-side -side or entangled development of kinship. And when I mentioned Lawrence Crader before, I mean, Crader discovered Marx uh, <laughs> and translated Marx uh, manuscripts, so I really, from the scratch, I grew up in anthropology with the idea that um, state and kinship are entangled and uh, was sozusagen uh, part of uh, the mother milk of anthropology uh, for me. What is specific to Engels and Marx approaches is that civil society, kinship and state are related to the development of political economy. That means forms of production exchange, economic value, exploitation, property relation and so on. Marx's influences, uh, influence approaches to kinship and state took different shapes. And that particular, that must be well known here under the influence of Stalin's formation theory from 1938. And uh, then East European ethnography under the Cold War, US, American neo-evolutionism of the 1960s, 70s, and neo-Marxist modes of production, theory of the French anthropologists, and so they took different um, developments. Um, the, uh, an important theory uh, for anthropology was the so-called uh, so conquest theory of state and its challenges. During the first part of the 20th century, the conquest theory of state, German Eroberungstheory des Staates, had a powerful impact on anthropological reasoning. 
particular influence, influential for the academic side of the discussion was the German sociologist Franz Oppenheimer, whose book The State, originally published in 19, uh, 1907, should reappear in many languages and editions. The conquest theory argued with the assumption that initial state building is due to the con conquest of settled peasant societies by mobile pastoralists who begin to treat and exploit peasants like cattle. This became a powerful picture forwarded by the Austro-German anthropologist Richard Thurnwald, who turned analytical text into suggestive graphics of toiling African peasants under the whim of idle cattlemen. There was no assumption of a kinship nexus between the ruled and the rulers. Preceding for theory were Austrian military soci sociologists like Gustav Ratzenhofer and uh, Ludwig Gumblowitz, who combined social Darwinism with conflict theory. Accordingly, some US American sociolo sociologists called it conflict theory of the state. Moreover, the conquest theory of states switched fully into political sociology replacing pastoralists with state-conquering elites and swallowed Marxist idea of class struggle and state conquest. Sociologists like George Sorel, Winfried Pareto, and Robert Michels during the 1920s and 1930s provided Italian fascism with a sociolo sociological approach to the conquest state. Within the orbit of US American cultural anthropology, several approaches developed under the influence of Franz Boas. Boas and his disciples looked at the state and kinship both vertically and horizontally. Boas himself, in an article on the nation from 1926, which preceded for him statehood, identified education as a sphere of state government which should be studied horizontally and comparative. Ralph Linton, 1924, wrote an analogy between totemistic groups and an US Air Force unit. And from here, development started to look at army units as a kind of family, extended uh, family. There are quite a lot of studies on that in the United States, but now also in Great Britain and also in Germany. Robert and Helen Lind did a study on Midwestern all-American town called Middletown and devoted a whole chapter to government. That was in 1929. Robert Lowy, he did, did the first systematic study on the emergence of statehood in 1928 used metadata emerging from diverse First Nations studies in the United States and numerous international ethnography. He dismissed the conquest theory of state as he dismissed other monocausal interpretations. Statehood developed for him, for him out of a combination of social complexities, local ties including kinship, territorial ties, male bonding and other elements. Kinship and state, for him, developed side by side. The quest for kinship and family relations to state politics was not pre-formulated, like in the Simata taken from Morgan, but was grounding in the data emerging from the research. During the war, Ruth Benedict's study on the social psychological character of the Japanese is a full-fledged attempt to link a type of statehood to the cultural personality of a people. The study was a complete death study based on secondary material. After the war, war the human relation area files, HRRF, developed by the uh, anthropologist, American anthropologist George Murdoch, developed a death study approach to the study of the state. For Murdoch, social structure was a building consisting of single bricks. 
relating the bricks in a statistically relevant way to each other would give insight into the conditions and laws of institutional development. With human relation area files, holistic ethnographies were cut into little pieces, filed as microchips, and the pieces then ordered as bricks to be reassembled for relational and comparative purposes. The approach had not only an academic, but also a military purpose within the um, area of the Cold War. It was a dual use project with civil military dimensions. Many institutes in the West use the human relation area files microchip collection, but there was little awareness about its military side. So now I see that I don't have much time because we need the discussion. Um, I will go uh, still a bit into uh, the Ethiopian is uh, issue, how uh, some of the ideas on statehood traveled into the uh, Ethiopian uh, context, and then I come to an end. Anthropology, anthropological theories about statehood and kinship traveled also to Ethiopia. I shall give two older examples which relate in different ways to variances of the conquest uh, theory of the state paradigm. One is the theory of the power state advanced towards the end of the 19th century by the German Egyptologist and Orientalist Eduard Meyer and one is a CEO linked to the assumptions of the cultural diffusionist <coughs> anthropologist Leo Frobenius, which became prominent during the 1920s and 1930s. An early anthropology of the state was advanced by uh, Meyer, and uh, it's actually called the Anthropology of the State. It's the first chapter of his first book on classical oriental and Mediterranean societies published in 1884. For him, the state had necessarily to precede family and forms of extended kinship. It is the external state that provi provides cohesion and protection, not the inner working of family or kinship. Eduard Meyer advanced a theory of the power state, Machtstaat, as the condition for sovereignty. The ideal power state had no evolutionist roots. It could be anywhere in time and space. Its space was usually based on conquest. When in the year 1906 a German diplomatic delegation came to the court of the Ethiopian Emperor Menelik II, to establish diplomatic relations between two empires, the chief diplomat, who was the trained Orientalist Friedrich Rosen, had two photographs from German archaeological excavations in Mesopotamia and Meyer's idea of the power state in his luggage. Other ideas uh, in the luggage were the idea of doing um, um, economic uh, investments um, like they did in the uh, Ottoman Empire, but that uh, part of the ideas did not work out in Ethiopia. The photographs would prove the truth of classical imperial cities like Babylon and Nineveh mentioned in the Bible. That were the centers of early power states. At that period, Emperor Menelik was deeply in need to defend Ethiopian sovereignty against the European colonial powers in Africa. Empirically proving the ancient roots of Ethiopian statehood by the means of archaeology appeared as an emergent possibility. Today we would call it, uh, call it the soft means of power in a political struggle. The rites of excavation in the ancient imperial city of Axum in Tigre was granted to the German Emperor Willem II, who gave the task to the Orientalist Enno Littmann. Littmann finalized in 1913 a multi-volume oeuvre, which did not find much interest at the start among the Ethiopian ruling class. They were busy with other things. 
but which should become an Ethiopian proof for the claims of 3,000 years of statehood when the Italians invaded and occupied Ethiopia in 1936. With the regain of Ethiopian sovereignty in 1941, the extension of Eduard Meyer's power state in Northeast Africa, entangled with Littmann's excavation, became an enshrined claim on the deep roots of Ethiopian statehood and sovereignty. Leo Frobenius developed a different perspective on Ethiopian statehood. The political model advanced by Frobenius combined an imagination of empire dominated by pastoralists with a rooting in local stability provided by agriculturalists. Empires with diffuse boundaries were often created in Africa with the agency of charismatic conquerors, but they were prone to decay, as um, Frobenius argued. What an empire kept together was not violence, but plan and stability for peaceful organization. Frobenius had several sources for his approach. One was an inquiry among African prisoners of war coming from the French and British armies in German camps during the First World War. One was the comparative work of the German anthropologist Heinrich Schurz on male bonding, age grading and secret societies from 906. One derived from geopolitical theories promoted by the geographer Georg Ratzel and the Swedish political scientist Rudolf Kjellen. The information on Ethiopia came from the Austrian lay ethnographer Friedrich Julius Bieber, who had widely traveled in, and published on Ethiopia and who was uh, accepted as, as a reliable uh, informant. The inquiry among American, uh, African prisoners of war was on behalf of the German colonial office. Frobenius came to the conclusion that pre-colonial statehood in Africa was initially linked to conquest and pastoral population, while peasant populations contributed community. The existence of community gave stability to statehood. The conquest community binary foreshadowed already assumption by Fords and Evans Pritchard on state segmentary society or kinship, but Frobenius did not turn to kinship. For him, experience in male bonding became crucial. From Kjellen, Frobenius took the idea to see the empire state as a type of natural geographical organism which shared with plant societies the particularity to be bound to a specific soil providing the necessary nourishment. However, Frobenius varied the argument, not the empire was plant-like and organic, but its most stable factor, the peasantry. Additionally, Frobenius advanced a second argument from, from Kjellen. For the later kinship and genealogy were not the sufficient elements for a nexus between state and nation. There were too many empirical cases whereby genealogically related groups belonged to different nation states. Necessary was a regimental order of male age grading that contributed to a communal spirit. In modern reflection, that was the army. Assumptions about the anthropological depths of male bonding, age grading, and war derived from Heinrich Schurz, who had done a comparative study on that. Information provided on Ethiopia by Bieber argued that Ethiopian statehood used to be associated with an eternal war between the mythic groups, Hamitic groups, Cushitic groups, Nilotic groups, uh, uh, nilotic groups as the geopolitical fate of the region. For Bieber, the small empire of Kaffa in southern Ethiopia was the true core of Ethiopian civilization where pious holy kings interacted with likewise pious peasant societies. 
Frobenius transferred Biber's ideal image of Kaffa on its own imagery empire of Kuss, or Kass as it said, in Northeast Africa, inhabited by pious African peasants the peasants, the so-called Ethiopian. The Ethiopian were not the same as the inhabitants of Ethiopia, but it were, was a synonym for what others called at the time the true Negroes, who later became the eternal victims of war and slavery in the region. When Frobenius' team members made research in southern Ethiopia in 1934, they believed to have found the true pious peasants and the heritage of Kush in the age and generation grading societies of South Ethiopia, the land of the Gada. The Gada is a term for age and generation grading. Yeah? And the Oromo people I was talking about have Gada now as one as of the national symbols. Since Frobenius and his team did not side with the Italian colonial propaganda of the time, former team members were welcome to continue their research uh, in the 1950s. Nowadays, actually nowadays, a remake of the geopolitical and ethnographic fantasies of past of Ethiopian status is visible in the internal discussions about the Semitic or Cusitic roots of statehood in Ethiopia and the ways to integrate the south with the north. Theories on statehood, traveling on one stage from the, south, from the west to the south, became itself tools of political um, contest in the uh, Ethiopian situation. Uh, now I will stop my contribution here and questions are up to you. for, for your uh, uh, very broad overview of, of uh, approaches towards kinship uh, and state. I was wondering, uh, among all those multiple, multiple perspectives that you mentioned, what would be <coughs> your take on, uh, on integrating uh, theoretically state and kinship? Well, I, I think one, one, uh, one has to, the, uh, to include the, uh, the process uh, dimension and see when uh, certain things come up. I mean, I was describing um, this group of people and how I related my ideas at that time, um, what is in literacy. Of course, there were certain people at that stage who said, yeah, literacy is linked to, it's a development out of, uh, not the development out of kinship, but it is uh, getting a function linked to kinship um, before. Um, what I could not see at that stage was uh, how they really relate kinship to their political demands, because kinship was not as at the center of what they understood at commu as community at that time. That what I described was this uh, circle of, of, of giving and taking and, and so on. After, um, the, um, after 1991, um, OLF came into the country, then was thrown out again. It was visible that the ruling state um, party was deeply in need to get uh, cadres that had a high status within Oromo society. And then kinship became suddenly important for the whole discourse because they had to recruit people um, from kinship, from important kinship group, from important lineages. And the um, issue of literacy, they used the same uh, literacy pro uh, program for uh, their state making within Ethiopia. 
being literate in the Oromo language and uh, having a high lineage status, where people specialize in certain things like religion, oral history, and, and uh, so on through their um, family, uh, there is uh, such recruitments were important for uh, the party that was not visible in the 19, um, uh, 1970s, uh, uh, 1980s. Um, the <coughs> so on the process level, it is, uh, one has to see where kinship com comes in. I mean, what I said about the arena approach of uh, Thomas Bierzeng and Olivier de Zadar, Look where it comes in. If it's not there, then okay. Yeah? Not to assume it must be there, but uh, simply going from the ethnographics, from the bottom to see where it comes in. Uh, I gave you this example that uh, what, I, what, I, what I said, what is in the, so to say, a background of this community of readers. I associated it with. Um, um, uh, search practices uh, 30, 40 years before. Now, I was not aware at that stage how this reading groups, the, the first readers in the church who read the Bible, how they were linked to kinship because the um, empirical data were. Not there. During the 1980s, 1990s, I did a study about the development of anthropological fieldwork and imagination in Ethiopia and about Ethiopia. And um, at the end of my research, towards the end of the 1990s, I found that there are uh, nearly a dozen of German documentary films um, coming out from 1925 to 1956. Um, full one and a half hour films. But of course, at that stage, one could not go into the films. It was not yet digitalized, and it was difficult to look into the mic and into the um, nitro films and so on. Um, I was able to do that for the last five, um, six years. And then one of the films um, shown by the missionaries that, that provided the first readers with, um, 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 with the Bible material is uh, a scene where you see a shrine of traditional Oromo religion. And the shrine is full of little uh, figurines from clay. And the shrine was administrated by a local priest within what is now called Oromo religion, a so-called Kalu. And the figurines symbolize the ancestors of people. And what is said about the shrine is that um, the, um, uh, the concept of Oromo religion is like that, that uh, God is everywhere. In every item, there's one God, and God has his emanations called the Ayana. And there's an Ayana here, there's an Ayana in you. There's an Ayana in your dead grandfather and, and, and so on. Now, if for some reason the Ayana is dissatisfied with something, the Ayana will quarrel you. It is the sins of the grandfather or something else or what you did or so that comes up. And you have to pacify it somehow. And the Kalu mediated uh, the pacification. It's a, an Oromo concept of sins. And, uh, People had to give uh, this clay figure to the Kalu, but they also had increasingly to pay him. I had to give food, had to give money, had to give cattle, and uh, so on. So towards uh, the early years of the 20th century, obviously the burden imposed by the Kalu on the people with regard to the sins of the ancestors 
became too burdensome for some. And Christianity was an alternative that we, well, Jesus died for our sins. And um, so you do it once and for all and uh, don't have to pay several <laughs> times. Uh, so for, since Ethiopian Christianity was not so attractive for um, the people because it was linked to the state. But then coming the Protestant Christians, that became attractive uh, for them. And the first reading communities came out of those families who had decided, uh, let's get rid of the burdensome structure of Oromo religion. And, uh, but they were forced to be readers first, to join the issue. And of course, I did not know that when I did my, my research on the practices of literacy among the uh, Oromo Liberation Front. But I see now uh, so, so saying, a remote relation, and um, that would be my suggestion. And, um, yeah, look, try, see, is there something? And, uh, but um, to say, be open if there is nothing. <laughs> And it's, as I said, it's a process. Um, the, um, it's certainly now that the kinship issue is much more important, it's only two days or three days a leading, um, leading Romo historian, an Africanist. Uh, he, uh, he wrote a warning article that uh, the kinship issue is, uh, is coming back on the uh, Romo uh, scene, and it will be divisive and divisive. and then and so on. And so I could not argue in the same way as I did 40 years ago. Um, very interesting, <laughs> going in, uh, into many dimensions. I would have several questions, but in the time, we will just cut into two. You said the securitization and the weaponization of kinship. I mean, the weaponization I know from your article, but you now <coughs> um, have done several times both of them, and you made a distinction. And for me, the distinction was not very clear. What is the distinction between sequelization? Because in both were genetic testing, and uh, so that would be one question. And the other question is that you, so you said Grafman derived the situational analysis, so the bridge from Barandi, uh, and that was later translated into what Bierschenk uh, and the Salon for Ari and others for the arena. Did I get that right? <laughs> and how did the how did the situation, the Glockman situation, derive from Barandi? No, the, the other way around. The other way around. Okay, I see. So I will go deeper <laughs> into. <laughs> Between uh, securitization and weaponization, is there is weaponization a part of securitization? Or no, when, when, <coughs> I, when I use the term weaponization, I, I argue that uh, it's directly taken as a, as a matter of military thought. Now, securitization uh, seems uh, it's a bureaucratic process. It is much broader. It's not just concerning the military. It's concerning the police and uh, it's uh, the law. Now, if you go, we have what we have now in, 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 in Germany um, is the, uh, the, the dangers of uh, Arabic clans and its, uh, its, its, its criminal practices and so on. I would not say that in this case it's a weaponization, but it's, it's, it's a securitization of the discourse, with, which excluded a lot of things what we know about clans. I mean, it's not an anthropological discourse. It's a popularized and a media discourse and so on, but uh, that includes the securitization process. And it's something else, and uh, organizing uh, kinship group as a group of uh, proxies in a civil war, what they did in uh, Iraq or in 
Afghanistan. I have another question. And I don't know. It, it's more reflection also about this uh, transparency uh, and uh, securitization of, of things. Uh, there, there is a clear um, mm, possibility of conflict between between kinship as as it is uh, mm, uh, relayed among the, the kin through kind of common knowledge. And uh, and that possibility uh, of no, uh, of produced knowledge that is produced through genetic analysis, they might uh, not coincide. So so it is not uh, only about transparency, because uh, and and you are speaking also about this kind of. Uh, the, the the British discourse on on uh, on gamete donations and uh, and uh, and the right to know who is your uh, ancestor, but in outside this this uh, highly technicalized process of uh, of gamete donation and and new reproductive technologies, the uh, this the knowledge of kin relatedness is not certain in uh, i mean it is assumed but uh, when it comes when when the the genetic analysis comes it, it it's it might be clearly different so so it is not only about the the right to know or transparency but also about some kind of disruption possible disruption mm -hmm. which is actually w when you order uh, 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 a genetic uh, analysis for all these uh, s um, currently available services, they include that in kind of contract that it might disrupt your and your uh, kin's uh, uh, lives forever, and you have to sign that. So, <laughs> so it's, there is a very interesting um, um, uh, dynamic between these two processes. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I mean, you are. I said before, we have to look at processes, and I think um, if we do ethnographic uh, work in the field, we have to describe the, uh, the dialectics of the situation and uh, to see what is really in the situation. Of course, when I'm now talking briefly about the issue, I'm mostly talking about one side of the issue, and it's, it's not always possible to, to include the other side. The issue. I mean, some people uh, said, uh, and that was also great, uh, that anthropolo anthropology has to be always dialectical and includes the, the different sides. Is there, but when you talk about the effects, I mean, it, it's very, it's very uh, fashionable at the moment. So we get book titles like Affected States, and we get all the calls for, you know, more of the stress on, on uh, emotions and effects. And it's about yesterday also, so it, it's all over the place. Did I got that right that you wanted that you make a critique of that by saying that earlier that was called propaganda? Uh, yeah, that <laughs> was a critique. Um. But on the other uh, side, uh, you had already Victor Turner, and uh, he, a lot of things what he says about the transformative um, capacities of ritual, no? the way how people begin to change elements of what is, so to say, normal of their behavior and so on, and, and find other ways. It has to do with affects. I, will, I, I, I went into the text, I also went in the text, uh, what did I write about it 30 years ago? And I, I, I mentioned the affective side briefly, very briefly. What I see now is it's uh, a, well, a lot of wind is made about it. And, Part of the wind is simply uh, what others said, propaganda. Of course, Goebbels, Goebbels was full of affective speech. No? <laughs> That's it's basically a warning also. Like yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just wanted to ask if you, uh, I, I liked um, um, uh, a lot of aspects, but uh, one that has not been taken up by the discussion was um, the aspect that uh, <coughs> binaries are not only made by, by us, by the West, uh, and then traveling to the rest, but also vice versa, or they have a lo there's local binaries that we have to kind of can you maybe a little bit illustrate it with? Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, there is an Oromo, a total Oromo genealogy, like there's a total Somali uh, genealogy. Now, the Somali, they really think their state is, or some Somali think their state is the total genealogy. The Oromo genealogy is now also positively discussed. It was not discussed the same way 30 years ago. And uh, that it is positively discussed, I think it is related to the fact that the party needs cadres coming from important lineages. Now, the text comes from the 16th century. It was written by an Ethiopian uh, priest. And the priest compares the lineage society and the age grading system of the Oromo with the, um, with the ordered, uh, with, with Northern Ethiopian Amharic Imperial Society ordered according to um, occupational groups and uh, so on. That's, uh, clearly, it was somehow related to the division of, uh, of work. And the terms the priests use in the Gay's language indicate that it is, um, yeah, uh, that the Linux side is something that inappropriate. And this type of arguing in terms of inappropriateness, it comes through in all the historical sources the, uh, which exist in the Gays and in the Amharic discourse since the Oromo came into the Ethiopian saying. So if we go into this issue, it's a completely binary in a local discourse, nothing to do with the European. Or, well, of course, there were the Portuguese, and there were the Spanish, and the Catholics, and so on. So they had already an influence on the uh, situation, but there's also the local aspects. No? And then you have in the oral so, uh, um, traditions of the different groups, the way Oromo describes Somali, Somali describes Oromo, so it's full with binaries. There is no more questions. We can uh, thank you very much again. And And we wanted to uh, hand you also over the bag. <laughs> Thank you. And downstairs there is coffee waiting, and uh, we will take these uh, uh, pastries again <coughs> to accompany coffee. And we reconvene at. Uh,